All right, welcome to CS 4510. Uh, this is the second half of lecture 12, the most important course, the most important lecture in the whole course. This is on the halting problem. Uh, so this is the finale of our epic that began like 300 BC and ends with 1936. And we're going to talk about one result today by Alan Turing, which cemented himself as the father of computer science. Not only the father of computer science, but the, um, like, he found, with the result we're going to discuss today, he founded the entire field of computer science, and he ended the, all of Hilbert's program. So, basically what happens is, like, Alan Turing is a young guy. He's British, unfortunately. He, he's in uh, England. He's, uh, he takes a course on the foundation of mathematics, and the lecturer there uh, is telling him about Gödel and completeness theorems. And he, he, he's learning about Principia Mathematica and all the things that we're learning about now. And... Um, there's one open problem. Uh, all of Hilbert's program has been defeated by Gödel at this point. It's unsalvageable. And there's a one part that's left, which is on uh, decidability. So during the class, he learns about this open problem, which is called the, and I'm going to butcher this, the Unschreibung. Unsch problem. So... Um, this basically is just German for decision problem, but I like to call it, I think it should be called Hilbert's uh, decision problem. So the Germans are really bad at naming things, okay? Because if you translate this, this quite literally just means decision problem. But it, they, you call it a big fancy word, it sounds cool. Um, do you guys know eigenvalue and eigenvector? Do you know what eigen means in German? Do you remember? It means characteristic or special. So when the Germans were saying eigenvalue and eigenvector, they were saying my special vector, my special value, which is too generic of a name. And then when we translate it into English, we can't call it my special vector. That sounds weird. So we just call it the eigenvalue, the eigenvector. Um, same thing with here. I don't know if the poor naming from German to English is all of German's fault or specifically Hilbert's, because Hilbert named many things that we call them. Like, I don't know about eigenvalue and eigenvector. I think those are much older than him, but I know eigenfunction is his fault. Specifically, so uh, the, it, the Einstein-Einstein problem is really just Hilbert's decision problem, and there are many uh, ways to formulate it. One way is like uh, uh, give an algorithm. I'll say I'll say I'll give a decision procedure. To determine on input. A logical formula, which may have free variables, of course, if it is true or false. Right? So if it has free variables, you would determine for which, which values of those variables is it true or false. Um, in the way that we formalized our class, this doesn't make much sense. So the better way I would, uh, I would formulate it using the notation we've just talked about is to, pro is to show uh, every language is decidable. That's the way I would have uh, I would have worded um, the Einstein problem, the Hilbert's decision problem. So Alan Turing uh, solves this problem, basically. He comes out of the blue, young guy, he works he hears about this problem, he hears about the foundation of mathematics, he learns about Gödel and completeness, and it's no secret he was inspired by Gödel and completeness. And he solves this problem. He comes out with a resolving answer, uh, no. Um, as worded, it isn't, it's not a yes or no question, it's just give me an algorithm. And Turing says there is no algorithm. There exists, an, as Gödel proved that there exists unprovable formula, uh, Turing shows there exists unsolvable problems. There exists uh, problems which have no algorithmic solution. There's no way to solve certain problems. Um, so he has to do a lot of work to get here. First, uh, what does he do? First, step one, uh, invent uh, the Turing machine. He didn't invent these things because he thought they were cool. He invented them specifically to solve this problem, and this is the problem we're going to talk about. So first step, you want to be like Turing, you have to invent the Turing machine, OK? Um, Fine, he's given some kind of formalization of a decision procedure and algorithm. Second, he has to invent what we now call uh, the Church-Turing thesis. Uh, 
So the insurance problem, the Hilbert's decision problem, is effectively a question about quote-unquote decision procedures. This is not an idea that had been formalized very well, and it actually had been formalized poorly uh, historically. This was thought something to do with maybe arithmetic. Um, but it, naturally, intuitively to us, a computation is not simply an input and output, but a sequence of steps. There are, in, and that's quite exactly what the Turing machine characterizes, because it has steps. It does. The sequence of steps is the computation rather than the result. It's not a functional model explicitly, but it is a model. And the fact that it works so well is because it's about the journey and not necessarily the goal, right? So he invents the Church-Turing thesis to say, what we now call the Church-Turing thesis at least, that the, that the Turing machine is encapsulates definitively this model of quote-unquote algorithm, decision procedure, uh, decision process, mechanical process, and so on, right? And... Uh, the, the, the concept, the intuitive concept of a decision, procedure, a decision procedure or an algorithm is independent of the model chosen necessarily. There are, of course, deficient models. NFAs and uh, PDAs, of course, are, of course, deficient. But most of the models, Turing completeness, they're all the same, right? All, and they're indep the idea of algorithm is independent of any specific formalization. So then uh, he, uh, he does two proofs. After, after coming up with these two, he co comes up with two proofs uh, that there exists unsolvable problems. Uh, first, we, we need to recall some definitions. So recall that a language is decidable. And I'm going to use this notation. L is in uh, curly L subscript D TM. So L is decidable by a Turing machine uh, if uh, there exists a Turing machine M uh, uh, such that uh, for all inputs uh, W, you can give the Turing machine. Uh, M on input W uh, accepts and halts if and only if uh, the answer was right. And M on input uh, W rejects and halts if and only if uh, W was wrong. So basically, the language is uh, a set of strings. And a decidable language is one which has a machine to decide it. The machine exists uh, to say yes or no for every answer to the co that could be asked about the problem question. So for example, a decidable language is like, given this um, quadratic formula, does it have a real root? Something like this, right? Yes or no, right? Um, Note that the decidable languages are exactly those which encapsulate the notion of an algorithm. Because if there exists a decider for a language, then the decider itself is an algorithm. Okay? We don't, our definition of an algorithm does not allow looping. Okay? It has to always say yes and always say no. This is the natural encapsulated, this is the definition of an algorithm. A decider is simply an algorithm. It doesn't say anything about efficiency or possibility. It only, excuse me, it doesn't say anything about efficiency, only possibility. If there exists an algorithm at all, the algorithm halts on all inputs. Notice that M has to halt yes or no, has to halt yes or no correctly. Right? This is the notion of an algorithm. So what is the relationship between the set of Turing machines, uh, the set of decidable languages, and the set of all languages? So this is the set of all languages, this is the set of decidable languages, and this is the set of Turing machines. So notice that every decidable, here's, he does two proofs of, of their existence solvable problems. First, he does a simple kind of counting argument, non-constructive proof. How many, uh, so every decidable language, by definition, is decidable. So there exists a decider for it. But there may be more than one decider for it. More than one kind of code, which looks different, can do the same thing, right? So here's the set of Turing machines. Here's the set of languages, decidable languages. Every Turing machine, every decidable language has a Turing machine. So this map is certainly surjective. From Turing machines to the languages they decide is surjective. There is no missing language in, there is no decidable language which does not have a machine to map to it. Uh, but it's not going to be total because there may exist 
machines which loop on some inputs, right? So those machines don't decide a decidable language. And certainly more than one machine can decide the same language, okay? So from here, we can garner, because this is surjective, we're not overcounting or undercounting the number of languages. But certainly, it's true that there are more Turing machines than there are languages. Do we agree with that? Why? Every Turing machine has a language in a way that is surjective. There may be more Turing machines than languages, but certainly there are not. Uh, there are less languages than Turing machines. Both of the sets are infinite. Why are both infinite? Do we believe that they're both infinite? Infinitely many Turing machines, infinitely many decidable languages make one each language like a singleton set, right? Certainly there's infinitely many decidable languages. So they're both infinite. So this is the first remark, is that there are more machines than there are languages. The second remark is that the number of Turing machines is countable. Why? So you have to give a bijection from the naturals to the Turing machines? Or from the Turing machines to any other countable set, surjectively. Right. Excuse me, injectively. How do we know how to prove a language is countable? You show... Um... Like you said, an injective. What would be the injection? I missed some of that lecture. Was the um, was every string countable or no? Yes. Typewriter principle. All right. So to, be, to apply the typewriter principle, we need to argue that every Turing machine has unique encoding. OK, well, it's easier if we understand the Turing machine not as a state diagram, but as code. Code has unique encoding, because code is just a string. If you, count, if you don't consider it as each new line is a different string, if you consider the character with the new line as part of the alphabet, and that's just the way it's rendered in the terminal, then certainly every Turing machine has a string. So every Turing machine, by the typewriter principle, because there's unique encoding of every Turing machine, then the number of Turing machines is countable. Okay? Certainly the number of Turing machines is countable. Fine. There are more Turing machines than there are decidable languages. From here we can conclude what? That the number of decidable languages is countable. Excuse me, not just countable, countably infinite. Right. So the number of decidable languages is countable. Fine. What is the number of uh, all? How many languages are there in total? Is that ALF one? Yes. Why? Because it's the power set. Yeah. So the power set of any uncountable set by Cantor's theorem is uncountable. So there's only countably many decidable languages. There's uncountably many languages. So the countably, so the countable, excuse me, the decidable languages are nothing except a small subset, a countably small amount of the total number of possible languages. Right? So, by Cantor's theorem, there is no bijection between the decidable languages and all languages. So there exists, excuse me, there's no surjection. So there must exist, so by Cantor's theorem, uh, there must exist languages which are not decidable. 
This is a kind of a, uh, although it seems kind of cheap, there's actually two deep remarks here. First off, if you consider the languages themselves as problems, and you think the decidable languages are really corresponding to the solutions to those problems, the decidable languages are, langu are problems that have solutions, and the power set of sigma star is a set of all problems. So in some sense, there are infinitely many more problems. The scope of the number of problems is much larger than the possible solutions. So we only have finite, we only, no, excuse me, not finite. We only have countably many solutions, but infinitely many more, uncountably many problems. There are more problems, therefore, than solutions. Second is the difference between LTM, LDTM, and TM, okay? TM is a set of syntactic objects. These are programs that do something. LDTM is not about the programs themselves, but about the behavior of the programs. The language is, a, is, a, is an infinite set which is accepted and rejected by the Turing machine. So the languages are a semantic property. They're, these are semantic objects, and the Turing machines are syntactic objects. Syntactic objects are just sort of descriptions, and the semantic ones are the ones with meaning. These are about the behavior of the machine, and this is about the machines themselves, certainly. So basically, um, there's, there's a difference here between, the, between, between what is meant, uh, what is said, the description of the Turing machine, and what is meant, the behavior of the Turing machine. So this is Turing's first argument that there are unsolvable problems. Now, obviously, um, certainly we are comparing two infinite sets. It doesn't really seem constructive that there are unsolvable problems. We've certainly shown just now that there exist, non-constructively there has to exist un unsolvable problems. But are there any actual like solvable problems that we may care about? Um, Turing also says yes. He proves the first uh, known and constructed undecidable language. And of course, kind of back to the uh, difference between syntax and semantics, it's a problem explicitly about the behavior of machines. This is a language called HALT. Halt is a language consisting of pairs of machines and words such that M halts on W. So this is a set of strings. The strings represent a program with a word combination. They're a pair. And if there did exist the decider for this language, you could give it a machine and a word determine if the machine would halt on the word or not. We formulated this as a language question, but it's really about the machines themselves. So given a machine and a word, can you, not given the machine as a physical device, but as a, a string encoding of the machine, it turns out the same thing, right? But you're given a string representing the machine and a word, can you determine if that machine would halt on the word or not? Alan Turing proved this is undecidable. Uh, he actually, I think he called this something weird, like circle, circular and circularity free or something. He has some weird notation. Halting, the, the calling it halting, uh, came much later, after some intuition about how programs uh, work, you know, like actual, I, the, some of the first IBM systems. So how are we going to prove this? We're going to prove it by a contradiction, so assume to the contrary. Halt is decidable. So there exists a decider. H. So by decider, I mean a little cute program that looks like this. I'll put it here. This is a decider H. It takes as input uh, M, and it outputs uh, yes and no. So this is a program. I'm representing it, I don't know, as a UML diagram or something. This is a program, okay? The decider, by definition, a decider always accepts or always rejects, okay? So assume to the contrary there exists a decider for this language. Uh, here we would give it the, we've, I'm representing this as kind of like a circuit with wires, but it's really like a program, right? Uh, it, this is the part where you would put M, this is the part you would put W, and it returns a Boolean, okay? Um, I claim then, because we assume to the contrary that H exists, I claim this program called D exists. All D is going to do is it's going to take on one input, one argument, it's going to then plug it both its input into M and W for the decider of H. If 
Halt says yes. Our program is going to infinitely loop. If our program says no, if Halt says no, then our program is going to return. Now, what does this program do? It appears to be useless. Kind of it is. Um, but certainly, if H exists, then D exists. Okay. If I gave you H as a subroutine, you could program D. No questions asked. Right. All D is going to do is simply take whatever its input it is. So D on M. Uh, so D takes on one argument. Okay. And what is it going to do? It's going to just pass both of those. It's one argument to H twice for both arguments. So if H of M comma M, uh, if H of M M returns, we're going to infinitely loop. So I'll put while true here. Continue. And if H of M uh, rejects, return. So convince yourself first, it's not obvious, that the program I've written here in Python is equivalent to this description of a Turing machine I've given. Okay? H, we, we assume to the contrary this decider exists. Maybe it's given as a Turing machine. Okay? Certainly D exists if H exists. And the existence of H here in this construction is dependent upon the existence, excuse me, the existence of D is dependent upon the existence of H. Any questions about this? Yes? What, what is the... Uh, that, yeah. That's the infinite loop. I don't know how to draw an infinite loop as a I diagram. See, right. right? Because things, it looks like a circuit doesn't halt. A circuit can't infinitely loop, right? So I, I had the little box there. Okay. Right. This is this part here. While true. So if H on MM returns true, we will loop. And if it returns false, we'll, we'll accept. Okay. This is a Turing machine like any other. So there exists the string representing this Turing machine is D. Right? What is... What happens when you take the machine D and run it on the string representing its own encoding? This is the question. Now, don't be scared that all those symbols are there, okay? D is a program. D in brackets is a string. This is a string of the code of the program. We're taking the code of the program and passing it to the program itself. There is a small distinction here between the program itself as an object running on strings and a string representing the object itself, right? Certainly, there should be no challenge here because compilers are, what is that, bootstrapped? They can compile themselves. You make an update to the compiler, you can compile itself, and then you, you know, make another update, you compile itself. Compilers compile themselves all the time. They don't even need to make an update, I guess. You can just compile the compiler, right? There's no problem of a machine running on its own code. It's not illegal. It might be a little weird, uh, grotesque even, but it's certainly you know, nasty. It's not illegal, though, okay? It's certainly allowed. So what happens if we run D on D? Um, every machine either halts or loops on its own input. So we have two cases. The first case is if D on input D halts. The second case is if D on input D loops. So the machine on a word is either going to loop or it's going to halt. Okay. So let's do case one first. Suppose D on input D uh, halts. So D on input D halts. Uh, that's true if and only if, uh, by our construction, the decider says so as well, right? H on input the string encoding of D and the string encoding of D will uh, return true. Do we agree so far, this first step? If D on D halts, our decider is correctly going to say, yeah, D halts on D. It's going to return true. Okay? But if the decider returns true, what happens? If the decider says D on input D halts, this top wire is going to light up because we return true. This top wire lines, lights up, we go to an infinite loop. So if we go to the infinite loop, D on input D Loops. So D on input D 
halts if and only if d on input d loops. That's bad. That's not good. So maybe it doesn't. Maybe. Maybe it doesn't loop. Maybe it doesn't halt. Suppose it loops. Okay. Suppose d on input d loops. Okay. If d on input d loops, then h says it loops. So h on input d, input d, uh, returns false. It's a decider. So h will never loop, of course. It's assumed to be a decider. It always says yes or no. Uh, h on input d, d returns false. Okay. That means this wire lights up. If this wire lights up, what happens? We instantly return. If h on d on input d returns false, we return. What is, happens when you return? You halt. So d on input d either halts. If it halts, then it loops. And if it loops, then it halts. A machine cannot halt and loop on the same input simultaneously. So a contradiction, H cannot, decider H cannot exist. If decider H cannot exist uh, for language halt, we didn't assume anything else about H except that it exists and it is a decider. So no decider for halt exists, and therefore halt is undecidable. Alt is not a decidable language. There is no program to determine this. A quick application of this immediately is like, if you've ever used an IDE plugin or whatever, it would seem useful there's one to tell you if code has an infinite loop or not. It's, unsol it's an unsolvable problem. So they, they, no one is bothered, no one smart has ever bothered to try and write such a thing, obviously, because it's impossible. Pro mathematical proof of impossibility. If it was possible, take the code of the plugin do a little bit of flipping like this and plug it back into the IDE, right? This is the fact that there exist unsolvable problems seems uh, uncomfortable. It seems evil, but it's really not like the end of the world. It's just sort of a consequence of the way we have to deal with these kinds of systems. Um, there's some analogy made like this is nothing more than like the fact that uh, you know you can't build a perpetual motion machine as a consequence of uh, conservation of energy, right? No one complains about, oh, I can't build my perpetual motion machine. Perhaps it's the same idea. There has to, the fact that we can solve problems at all means that we, you know, as, a, as an exchange, that we have some problems that perhaps we can't solve. What kind of proof is this? What's the proof technique used here? It is a diagonalization proof. Why? We have some sort of, instead of a negation, we have looping. Uh, when we say we're not going to loop, and then halting when we say we will loop. We run, there is a diagonal element, which is running the machine on its own code. If I were to write this uh, more clearly as a table, and I don't mind doing it for this one example, even though I'm opposed to uh, having tables for diagonalization proofs. Consider on like the south axis here, the south axis, the vertical axis, I had machines. And on this, I had code of machines. Right? Something like this. Um, each one, each element is going to be accept or reject. Each machine either accepts or rejects, excuse me, halts or loops on its own input or not, right? Um, what happens? Well, D is a machine, certainly. So D exists somewhere in the table. And the code of D also exists somewhere in the table. So what happens when you run D on its own thing, right? The diagonal of this table represents the machines running on their own encoding. H exists only if D, D exists only if H does, okay? But if D exists, the machine can't halt and loop on its inputs, on its own input, it halt and loop on its own code simultaneously, right? It is, in some sense, this is the diagonal part. It is the, it is the diagonal element here. D cannot exist. You assume to the contrary D is a machine. I mean, by construction, you assume to the contrary H is a machine and construct D. D must be somewhere on this call, in this column. It can't exist. Right? This is nothing. This is this is a proof by diagonalization, and this is really the end of uh, the you know Hilbert's program. And this one result, Alan Turing, then you know 22 or something, he founded uh, computer science. This was the first result of computer science and the birth of our field and the death of another. It's it's really a phenomenal result. Very beautiful. 
So we've now shown that there exists a language uh, which is undecidable. But you know, there are a few coping strategies you could do here. Um, we proved that there exist languages which are undecidable, but what about recognizable? You guys remember the definition of a recognizable language? Uh, also called semi-decidable or recursively enumerable. So L is in, I'm going to use this notation, LRTM. If uh, there exists a TM, uh, M, uh, such that for all inputs of you in sigma star, um, if the answer is right, M is supposed to accept and halt if the answer is right. If, the, if, if it's asked to, if the answer is correct, it's supposed to be able to always say yes. If the answer is wrong, it's allowed to plead the fifth, basically. So we allow this machine to be, uh, if it's right, it's if the answer is right, it's supposed to be right. If the answer is wrong, we allow it to infinitely loop. It's sort of a relaxation of the definition of a decidable language, because certainly it's true that every decidable language is a recognizable one. Right? So maybe the definition of algorithm we gave, which is kind of dependent on the church turing thesis, is too strict. Maybe, sure, OK, we can conclude halt is not decidable. Um, maybe every language, though, is recognizable. Um, Halt is recognizable, right? Give me a recognizer for halt. Halt is this language given m and w. Determine if m halts on w. I'm asking you for an algorithm that if m halts on w, your machine should always say yes. And if m loops on w, you can say no, but you're also allowed to loop. Should you repeat the question? The language halt here is consisting of strings m and w, such that you want to determine if m halts on w. So you want to say yes if m halts on w. And if m, m doesn't halt on w, you are allowed to loop. You are allowed to make a buggy program here that can get in an infinite loop. You don't, but you can't say yes if the answer is no. You have to be correct or silent if the answer is no. Perfect. So the answer is like uh, rec or alt on input like m comma w um, run m on w if it ever accepts or rejects. Wait, is that what you said? Maybe? Is that what you meant? OK. Um, basically, just run m on w. If it ever accepts or rejects, it halted. It'll tell you it accepted or rejected. Fine. Then we're going to accept because we watched it halt. But it, we're going to watch it run. We're going to simulate it. If it gets into an infinite loop, we're just going to keep watching it, you know, like a five-year-old in an iPad. We're just going to keep looking at the thing. And we'll never accept or reject. We'll never get bored. We'll just keep watching it. We'll keep performing the simulation. Um, if M loops on W, so do we. That's, in, that's as implicit and essential here. If M loops on W, so do we, because we're just simulating it. If it ever accepts or rejects, then we accept, right? So if the machine loops on W, we're, not gonna, we're also going to loop. And therefore, this proves that halt is recognizable. Because halt is recognizable but not decidable, this actually proves that uh, this containment is strict. Now, that's the reason, of course, you could assume the containment is strict because we call them different things. If they were the same thing, we would call them the same thing, like the regular languages. The decidable languages are now different, provably so, than the recognizable ones. We've given an example of a language which is recognizable but not decidable. So now the question comes back, is our definition of algorithm too weak? Could every language be, sure, we've, we've proved that every language is not recognizable. Excuse me, every language is not decidable because we gave, we proved by diagonalization that halt was not re decidable. Could every language be recognizable? That seems like maybe we can half, that's a coping method. Uh, turns out, no. 
why, uh, what would you guys, what is a reason you guys might have the fact that every language is not also recognizable? So we gave a counting, we gave two arguments um, by Turing. One was non-constructive, one was constructive. The first one was the simple counting argument of the decidable languages using the Turing machines to prove that there were uncountably many languages and countably many decidable languages. We can just copy the same argument, okay? Every recognizable language has a recognizer. In fact, this argument is actually slightly simpler for the recognizable languages, right? Because every machine is a recognizer of some language. Every single machine. So in fact, it looks like this. It is now not partial, but it is, it is surjective and total. Right? Every uh, machine recognizes some language. So there are more machines than languages, recognizable languages. And there are countably many recognizable, there are countably many machines by the typewriter principle. So there's only countably many uh, recognizable languages. Again, still, there's uncountably many um, languages. So there exist uncountably many more languages than there are recognizers. So even if you consider this loosening definition of an algorithm, like can you allow something to half solve it, uh, it's still too many. There are still unsolvable problems by simple counting argument. I want to prove, though, non-constructively that there exists. We were able to prove that halt was not decidable. It was undecidable. There is no algorithm for halt. But we were able to show there's kind of like a half algorithm for halt just by doing it. Um, I want to prove, though, that there's, there exist languages which are not even recognizable. There's not even something that can be correct part of the time on halt. Um, we're going to do this, actually, just by kind of showing a relationship between another language and halt. Any questions before I begin about what, what, what the premise is? So we want to prove a language which is not even recognizable. We've proven that every language is, um, We've proven that there exist languages which are not decidable. We've given a counting argument why there are languages which are, un, which are uh, not, should not be recognizable. But I want to constructively give an example of a language which is not recognizable. It's not even recognizable. You can't even like semi-decide it. You can't even half decide it. Uh, first, we need a small lemma. So if, uh, well, I guess we could prove two, two quick lemmas. Uh, if L is in uh, the decidable languages, then L complement is a decidable language. Believable? If a language is decidable, its complement is decidable. Why? You just flip the return. Perfect. So like assume here here's how I might formalize the proof. Assume that a decider exists for L, we give a decider for L complement. The decider for L is M. Looks like this on input something. We give a decider for L complement as follows, called M complement. Uh, we're just going to do this. Certainly, the decidable languages are then closed under complement. You could just and if the and it's only actually because the decider uh, always halts. The loops on some input, how do you flip the answer if it loops, right? You can't really do it. So if the answer, if the, because the decider is guaranteed to always halt, we can just flip its output. Anything that's capable of always saying yes and no is also capable of always saying no and yes. Flip the answer, and the complement is also uh, uh, decidable. So here's another one. If a language and its complement are both recognizable, uh, then the language is decidable. And by the previous thing, it's of course also, its complement's also decidable. So if a language and its complement are recognizable, the language is decidable. 
If there is a machine that says yes on the good inputs and says no and says yes on the bad inputs, then you can combine these in a way that says yes and no correctly on all inputs. Here's the idea. Let L and L complement be, dis be recognized by machines uh, M and M complement. Okay. These are recognizers. They're not deciders. So they will always correctly say yes, but they may not always halt and say no, right? M decides L, and M bar decides L bar, right? What we're going to do is just run these machines in parallel. If M, we're going to run these machines in parallel. If M ever accepts, we know that M accepts if W was an L. So that means we know W is an L, so we can just simply accept. If M complement ever accepts, because it is, a, it is a recognizer, so if M was an L complement, excuse me, if W is an L complement, it must say yes. So it will say yes if W is an L complement. But if W is an L complement, W is not an L. So we know that we can reject here. Any questions on this quick lemma? If a language and its and a language and its complement are recognizable, we can combine them in a in a way to make a decider, and therefore it is decidable. Okay. Any questions on this lemma? Cool. Here's the consequence. Complement of halt is unrecognizable. So halt, we proved was recognizable and not decidable. I claim halt complement is unrecognizable. So proof by contradiction, suppose, it, suppose a halt complement was recognizable. Then uh, halt, halt complement being in uh, being recognizable languages implies, well, if a language and its complement are recognizable, we just prove that the language is decidable. So if there did exist a recognizer for halt complement, we already gave a recognizer for halt. Combined, they must imply that the language is decidable. So we're gonna, we can say then that that would imply that halt is decidable. But we prove by diagonalization that halt is not decidable. So we can only recognize the good inputs and not the bad inputs. So a contradiction. Therefore, halt is not even, excuse me, halt is recognizable, but halt complement is not even recognizable. It's unrecognizable. It's, beyond, it's way beyond that. To give you a picture of what we've done so far, um, basically two more little proofs I want to do today. Yeah. So what have we done so far? First, we proved um, that the regular languages exist, right? We proved that, L, the, that the NFAs were equal to the DFAs. Which were equal to the regular expressions. We talked about this class, several lectures, four lectures, I think, uh, maybe, maybe three on the regular languages. And then we talked about, then we used the pumping limit to prove that some languages were not regular. We proved that, uh, then we proved that those languages can be produced or decided by CFGs and PDAs, right? So we thought this was a, this was a, as a Venn diagram, this was a larger class for us to talk about, it was the context-free languages. Um, then we used a more complicated pumping lemma argument using this surgery on parse trees, if you remember. It was really ugly. But we were able to prove that there were some languages which were not um, context-free. Maybe they're context-sensitive. I won't draw that. But then we were able to show that there was Turing machines to decide those languages. And since they were decidable, they were in LDTM. Every regular language, every context-free language, these are, they're all algorithms to decide those. So they're all decidable. 
everything is in the decidable languages. Right? Today, we've just proven that there exist languages which are recognizable, yet uh, not decidable. So we are here now. Right? And we also just finished with the fact that there are languages which are not even recognizable. But what are they in? There's nothing else. There's no more circles we can draw, right? Why? Church Turing thesis. Church Turing thesis, anything, you know, within our ability to uh, comprehend has to come uh, through a model of computation, say the Turing machine. And the Turing machines correspond exactly and only to the recognizable languages. So there are things beyond us that are out here, right? And of course, this is kind of like a solar system graph. We know that this is sort of what the rings look like. We know that this is sort of the limit, like we can't go past here. But we were able, using techniques and tools from within our little galaxy, we're able to see things that are beyond the galaxy. We know that, we know that there are things out here, right? We know what, what, what was out here, what was, what was HALT? HALT complement, excuse me. We know that there are things out there. Not just things like count, we can count the things out there uh, non-constructively, but we know there are problems that we specifically can't even recognize. They're way, they're, 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 they're too far gone for us. And even then, we know that the size of this hierarchy from the recognizable languages all the way to the, to the uh, regular ones, these are only, each of these is describable by a finitely, by a, some sort of computational object, be it a grammar or a Turing machine or anything. They all have a mapping to some sort of object. And that, by the typewriter principle, means this whole space is countable. But, however, we also know the universe of the set of possible languages is uncountable. So we know that this whole, although I've drawn this picture to be like two-thirds of the board, it's really a tiny speck into what is like a really big universe of, of all the other possible languages. The part of the problems that we can perceive and understand is really small relative to the amount of problems that there are. That's why it was necessary, I think, to show that there exist uh, unrecognizable languages. We know... We know sort of what's beyond. Okay, I have one more uh, proof I want to do. So most people don't teach Godel incompleteness because it's kind of long. There's some notation involved. It was, it was a little messy. But I think it's important um, for several reasons. First is the fact that, it, that um, obviously there was some inspiration by Alan Turing in his proof of... Uh, uh, his proof of the halting problem that uh, there exist unsolvable problems. And in fact, uh, I think I mentioned this, but von Neumann was reviewing the draft of the paper and he could not believe that the solution was that simple. He, von Neumann very, was probably the first person to learn about Godel incompleteness from Godel. He understood Godel incompleteness quite well. He was the one who was advertising it in the United States and so on. He was the one giving talks on it. And he couldn't believe that the solution... For the algorithmic part of, of, of Hilbert's program uh, was simply just sort of a, uh, to, to define this transformation and do the same argument, but with uh, some sort of computation device. He also didn't believe that the Turing machine was universal and how simple it was. So we tried giving several generalizations of it, and he failed. And he had to uh, concede that the Turing machine was, in fact, uh, universal in the sense of algorithms. Um, there's actually deeper connections, like below, uh, more than just surface level, oh, this is a diagonalization proof, uh, between goal incompleteness and the halting problem. In fact, uh, there's, I don't want to enumerate the entire connection between the halting problem or the existence of undecidable problems and goal incompleteness, but I will give a kind of weaker form in, uh, a weaker a form of that. So assume we are in a complete and consistent axiomatic system. Then halt is decidable. So recall, a complete axiomatic system is one where all that is true is provable. Everything that is true has a proof. A consistent axiomatic system is one which there is no proof that 0 equals 1. Uh, every statement is either true or false, but not both simultaneously. So assume we are working in a, in a complete and consistent axiomatic system. It's the dream. Uh, of course, Godel says one can't exist. So, um, but suppose that we were working within one. 
we get to use those assumptions. Uh, then I claim halt is decidable. But we prove halt is undecidable, of course. So there is a connection here between the consistency and completeness of a system and the fact that undecidable problems exist. So how is our decider going to look? It's going to be pretty simple, actually. It's almost ridiculously. H on input. I claim this is a decider. H on input m, comma w. Uh, for p in sigma star, lexicographically. So what is this line? This is a for loop over an infinite set. But what we're doing here is just checking each string um, in alphabetical order. right? So it's going to be what? It's going to be the empty string first, and then the loop is going to go to 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, right? something like this. So, but infinitely often, you could probably assume that you can do an in infinite for loop this way, right? While true, i plus 1, something like this. doesn't really matter. Um, it has to be in some order. Uh, if P is a proof that uh, M halts on W, we accept. If P is a proof that M loops on W, then we reject. So another thing is that the halting problem is about generality, OK? It says in general you can't determine if a machine accepts or rejects, excuse me, if a machine uh, halts or loops on an input. But it doesn't mean you can't do this specifically. You can always look at certain machines and determine if they halt or loop, kind of. Just not always. Like, you can, there are some machines which obviously loop on all inputs, right? We gave a Turing machine that loops infinitely on its tape and just writes it over with A's. We gave, you can write a program that has an obvious infinite loop in it, okay? Plus one, minus one on the counter or something. Obvious infinite loop. Um, so there are times you can, pr and then you could convert that statement, oh, I see I'm doing minus one here, therefore it's going to infinite loop. You can convert that to a mathematical proof, right? So here's our program. We're going to brute force search over every single string. Just check if the string is a proof, and this can be done mechanically, by the way. This isn't coming up with a proof, this is just checking the proof, which is a mechanical process. There's no, there's no smoke there. Uh, just check if the proof, check if the string is a proof that M, M uh, halts on W or M loops on W. Like it's a proof that says, here's the statement of the proof that M loops on W. Oh, look, M loops on W. If we know that the proof of M loops, if we know that P is a proof that M loops on W, we know that M loops on W. So we can just reject. We can say that M does loop on W. Right. So the, the catch here, the important part, is that this machine only halts. This is, a mach this is an infinite for loop. It only halts. So H only halts on, H only, uh, halts on all inputs if uh, P exists. So it's going to, it's going to forever search for P, which is the proof. H only halts on all inputs if P exists for all, for all inputs. But every machine, of course, halts or loops on an input, but does it, but not provably halt or loop on an input. If there is, why? This is, uses the assumption of completeness, right? So this machine, this decider for halt only exists if the axiomatic system we're working in is complete. P exists. So H is a decider. And uh, halt is decidable. Right. You could turn this around to say like such a, an axiomatic system which was uh, complete and consistent could not exist there. Uh, otherwise, you could decide halt. Right. You could turn this into a proof by contradiction. Okay, that's uh, basically everything I have for you today. Any questions on anything we've done? We've done an insane amount of material uh, today, especially this week. This is really the last class, the only class that matters in this course is the only one that people take this course only for this, uh, for this, for this reason. The fact that unsolvable problems exist. They appear pretty infrequently in research. Like, there's not really applicable. You can't really say, oh, this is, 
undecidable. So I'm like, I, I get to give up and stop working on a problem. You know, most problems people care about are solvable. Um, but the fact that they exist at all is certainly, um, I don't know about a tragedy, but it's certainly a fact. Any questions? Awesome.